Howdy, howdy, y'all. Welcome back to Semantics. Today, I'm joined by Lucia. Lucia, hi, how's it going? Hey, Ben, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing, doing great. I'm doing great. I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. Um, yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, as we're starting, I wanted to acknowledge that this Thursday is Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Um, and so there's going to be tons of accessibility stuff just throughout the web. Um, you can you can follow things that are going on using the hashtag G A A D hashtag, um, and and you'll keep up with all of the good accessibility events going on. Um, there's also a conference going on right now called Access U, which is by Nobility, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing what some of those talks were. Um, but yeah, today we have Lucia. Lucia, would you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, I'm a software developer in sunny, sunny Phoenix, Arizona. It's probably going to hit like 100 and something today. Um, and I have had an interest in accessibility since I've started. And I have found that these automation tools that we're going to show to you today have been a super helpful starting point for learning about accessibility and for making your own websites accessible. Good deal. Um, yeah, so automation is... I, I think such an interesting subject for a lot of people. I, I feel like there's a lot of developers whose instinct is, um, I'm doing this thing, how can I automate? What can I automate? Um, so we're, we're gonna be getting into two specific tools today, um, but I wanted to, I guess, first have a, a conversation about um, what is automated accessibility testing for? And what are some concerns you might have with it or some some things you would look for in an automated testing tool? Right, right. Yeah, that's that's a great, great place to start. Um, I I introduced it as kind of a starting point for a reason, right? Like it's, it's really good to, um, I've found them to be useful for catching some things that might be uh, good starting points, but sometimes on a, on a deeper level, you might need to take a closer look at how you're designing your components or what's in your HTML, right? Um, I think as we go, as we continue uh, coding today, that we'll see some more instances of what I'm talking about, it'll become clearer, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I, I, I think with, with automation, right, like we, we're we're trying to prevent ourselves from having to do a whole bunch of repetitive work. Um in, in part because um accessibility testers, that's uh like that can be a very time consuming process. And you want to make sure that the people responsible for uh testing accessibility, um, including developers who should be testing accessibility, you want to make sure that they're focusing on high value problems. Um and while every problem can cause an impact and can make the user experience worse for disabled users. Um, certain problems are best solved by humans and certain problems are best solved by computers. Um, and so that I think like that, that's for me uh, why I love automated accessibility testing, right? Is it lets me focus on problems that are best solved by humans. Um, yeah, so we today, uh, do you want to kind of walk us through uh, what we're going to be testing and what we're going to be doing? Right. Yeah, we're going to be looking at my portfolio website. It's completely static. It's all CSS and HTML. I think there's like five lines of JavaScript for the hamburger up there. Um, and it's deployed on Netlify, but we'll be working on localhost and we'll be running two automated accessibility testing tools on it. One's a browser plugin, it's called Lighthouse, you may have heard of it. And the next one is from, I believe it's from Deck Systems and it's called Axe and it goes in your developer tools. And yeah, we'll take a look at them, see what they have to say and take a look at the differences between them. All right, then yeah, let's let's go ahead and do that. So uh, you've mentioned these two tools, is there one that you'd prefer to start with? Yeah, let's, let's start with Lighthouse. Um, I find in general that Lighthouse identifies fewer issues than Axe does, so there would be a good progression, I think, for our stream. All right. Yeah, so um, if I wanted to run Lighthouse for the first time, how might I do that? Okay, first you'd have to go install it, so you'd have to go Google um, 
Lighthouse Chrome plugin, something like that. Yeah. It just says run it. Um, download Chrome. Looks like it's just there. No installation needed. Oh, nice. Uh, in the audit. That was... Okay. So let's go ahead and give that a try. Yeah. I'm going to go desktop open my, my dev tools here. I'm going to go. There we go. Well, it says Lighthouse and not Audit, but I'm sure, sure that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so when you run Lighthouse, um, it looks like it's going to generate a report for us. It's got several categories here. Should we right. go with all of these categories or um, just a few? What do you like um, to know? All of these are, are helpful, but not all of them are, uh, I find, helpful for accessibility. So let's just uncheck everything but accessibility. Good deal. All right. Uh, and then should we run it mobile or desktop? Let's do desktop for now, since I believe that's what we're both on, and we could always do mobile as well um, if we've got time. Makes sense to me. All right, so Lighthouse is thinking about this. It's warming up, so it's going to be yeah. looking at our page, and then we've got a report. Yeah. So let's let's dive into this report. Um, it says these checks highlight opportunities to improve the accessibility for WebEx. Only a subset of accessibility issues can be automatically detected, so manual testing is also encouraged. So this is something you'll see with, I think, every accessibility tool that I've used is that um, they recognize that automation doesn't, you know, cover all of your bases, but it is a good, as I said, a good starting point. So if automated accessibility tests don't cover all cases, what are some cases that it might cover and what are some cases it might not cover? Um, let's, do you see in the right, uh, in, do you see the links do not have a discernible name tab there? Yeah. Okay. Click, click on that. Okay. Um, so it's identifying some of, some of the failing elements on my page. Scroll down a little more in the failing elements okay. part, because I think, oh, that's interesting. Um, there are some well, I had thought it identified my, um, if we scroll up a bit, there's a link up here. I mean, and and this is right there, um, which it, it has doesn't seem to have addressed quite yet. But if you'll see, if you click on that one, it'll open up in a new tab without a warning, and that's not a best practice for accessibility. Um, so while it's identified some of the issues with my links, right, they need better names, um, it hasn't identified this particular issue. So if you go through a page and you manually test every link, you'll see, oh, um, I'm getting these uh, browser tabs are intruding on my uh, tabbing experience, right? So. Mm -hmm. Um, that's something that I can manually check. Although this is interesting, it says looks like Lighthouse has identified some items to manually check. Um, it says there's ten yeah. of them. I wonder if those are available to us. Dealing with, there we go. Sorry, we had a a, a bot in the chat. Um, oh. un unless you were you're curious in becoming famous, uh, we can yeah. buy followers and viewers. Um, yeah. I know the place now. Um, all right, so I'm sorry, you wanted me to check on the additional items manually check? Yeah. Okay, I I like this suggest. I like to have a suggestion for manually checking because um, I've never I've never really done this part before. Uh, let's see, it says the page has a logical tab order, so that's something to to check. Tab of your page. Yes, good. Good things to look at. All right, so these these are things that it, it's not even necessarily flagging. It's just like, hey, White House is unable to verify these things for you. Right. So it's, just so, here's a, a checklist for your own manual testing. Exactly. Process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which I just, I like that a lot. Um, but we should probably address, let's just address one of these first failing elements. Um, okay. So. Let's do that. Yeah, links do not have a discernible name, so it's saying link text and alternate text for images when used as links. Um, that is discernible 
uh, unique and focusful improves the navigation experience for screen reader users. So it's saying mm -hmm. these links don't have a discernible name. Um, and if I dive to that link in the markup, we can see right. that it has like an icon in there, but, yeah. but no text. So a user wouldn't yeah. necessarily, like if, if you couldn't see the icon, you wouldn't necessarily know where this link's going. So one solution I can think of right now is to, instead of using an icon, maybe just to use a, uh, just text for, well, here's my GitHub, here's my LinkedIn, here's my Twitter. Okay. Um, got it. Let's see if we can find those links. So this is your, your source code that we've got here. And, um, yeah, yeah you, you've got, um, uh, it's all in one page, neatly organized. I love this. This is delightful. Um, okay, yeah, so these think... these are the links in question. So, what yeah. are you what are you proposing we do? Um, so I would like to remove the icon and put in. So, you... so, do you think GitHub would explain that link well enough, or do you think we need more context? I think that's a great question. I think GitHub would probably be sufficient, especially because people already know that they're on your portfolio site, right? So if right. I go to someone's portfolio and I see a thing that just says GitHub, like, seems pretty straightforward to me where that okay. would go. And then probably then correspondingly change the LinkedIn icon to just LinkedIn and then the Twitter one to Twitter. Yep. You got it. All right. So save this and then I'm actually, right now this is pointing to your yeah, uh, site. host site, but here it is on, on localhost with lab changes. So if I scroll down, now it says GitHub, LinkedIn, Twitter, and yes. if I rerun Lighthouse, I can generate this report, it's going to think, and we should hopefully see no more, oh, look at that, we went from a 96 oh, wow. to a 97, a whole percentage nice. point. Yeah. Um, and if I go to, what is the issues? I think well, it looks oh, like yeah. there's one there. Yeah, so it's color contrast, but we previously had, you know, one down here that's like, hey, there was no discernible text. That's gone. Right. It's, it's resolved. Right. Okay. Although what's what's convenient now is we can tab back over to the live site and see it um, so that people can see the differences. Yeah, let's see that. So here it is on the, the host site without any changes, and it's... Oh, it's a 94 yeah. excess. Yeah, so yeah. we went up three uh, points. Yeah, so here it had listed two issues, which were color contrast ratio and linked discernible name. Um, but that's now gone. Um, yeah. And so we only have one more problem to resolve that it's, it's surfacing for us. Yes, according to... Yeah, I'm, something that just popped into mind. I'm just really curious about what their like uh, algorithm is for you know accessibility and percentages. Like, what was it about yeah. those three links? Um, you know, is is the percentage of code a factor? Uh, is it what's the weight of each issue? That that would just be be fascinating to learn about. I think. Let's do some mad science. So I'm going to break the LinkedIn and Twitter um, oh God. links yeah, okay. again. Let's do some mad science. Uh, can, I, can I rerun? I can save it as a JSON. Um, let's see. Save. You know what? I'll refresh. Would you refresh? Yeah. yeah. Let's see if that works. Lighthouse. Is that? Uh, that is so weird. Why? Saved it. Oh, there we go. Okay. Had to close the dev tools and reopen. Yeah. Good to know. Um, Got it. Okay, so Ooh. it looks like it's by a uh, number of distinct issues, perhaps? Yeah, that would probably be the, the easiest algorithm to write. Uh, yeah. yeah. Probably introduce accuracy by giving things weight and seeing how many things. But then again, I don't know how much power it has to... Well, it can see all the HTML and should be able to do that. So, yeah. anyway. All right, let me... Uh, this back because we we fixed this now right yeah. um and so let's see this is twitter yeah so the the problem that we had that we just addressed um that lighthouse was able to find for us 
with that we had some links that had no discernible text inside, um, which meant that like if you're navigating with a screen reader, something that doesn't necessarily know how to interpret an icon of the GitHub logo, um, now the screen reader knows what to announce for this um, for this link. Or if you're using the page with speech control, you can now say GitHub as opposed to just not having anything you can target the link by. Um, so by uh, by giving us by telling us like, hey, this link has no discernible text, we we were able to go in and find exactly what what it was we needed to fix and and fix it. We've already bumped up the score quite a bit. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, the, the part of my brain that likes to check things off is like, I got that little dopamine hit by bumping up the score. You know, I, Gamified yeah. accessibility. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. It's what all the cool kids are doing these days, is gamifying yeah. everything. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so we, we have uh, one more. Let me refresh this. Rerun Lighthouse. We've got one more issue that uh, it's going to tell us to fix, which was the color contrast. Um, issue. So I'd like to dive into that. Um, yeah. Okay. So it tells us low contrast text is difficult or impossible for many users to read. Um, and gives us a link to learn more. So I think that's actually what I want to follow. Um, yeah. uh, but I'm going to scroll down. So it's pointing out we've got a few few links here. It looks like. Um, so the author at Darling Magazine. Um, it's got the visit my GitHub account. There's GitHub index room zero. Uh, so these are the four things. They're all links. Seems like you, you've got um, a link color that's um, not meeting color contrast requirements against both right. the light and dark foreground. Yeah, so that'll be interesting. If I go here, uh, it uh, kind of walks us through its algorithm for contrast ratio and, and why. Uh, I love when tools provide links to more information like this because it can really help you understand like the, the problem that you're trying to solve. Okay, so it's going to tell us to evaluate text color contrast, Lighthouse uses success criterion 1.4.3 from Web Content Accessibility Guidelines version 2.1. Uh, so it tells us specifically what requirements it's trying to meet. Uh, mm -hmm. If I follow this link, gonna give us a whole uh formula i think so i i think i need to like dive into here but there there is like a whole uh formula yeah notes on formula right here oh um i think uh it's it's somewhere you, you can usually find it um but maybe not at the moment uh but there is a whole like color contrast like formula that these tools use um yeah, the math behind color is is super yes. fun. Into. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and also, yeah, the math behind color, like that's that's like it's intense. There's a lot behind it. And it's not something that you or I should be having to calculate for every element no. of the page. We, right? we don't need to. Yeah, it should be something that we can use a tool for, right? Um, as as fun as the math is. Um, yeah, it's it would it would take me six years to get an accessible color contrast sometimes if if I really really dove into mm -hmm. all of all of the math behind color. But um, so uh, how sh how should we fix this? How can we get it? Because the reason why this is still up here is that I had tried to fix it before, and I had just made like a wild guess, and I was like, I'm gonna make it a whole lot darker, and then you know I still had a problem here. So. I would like to use a tool. Do you have any in mind? Um, not at the moment. If you've got a tool you like, let's go ahead and use that. Yeah, I I just Googled before our session, um, and this one looked interesting, the one I have in our Zoom chat. If you want to pull that one up. Yeah. All right. Let me pull up this link you sent me, stick it in the, the chat here. Okay. So show me the closest variance of we provide a color that contrasts against uh, the color. Oh, oh, interesting. Um, that contrasts against a color that we provide enough to meet double A guidance. Right. Yeah. So the color that we're starting with 
is I'm gonna say no in your CSS file, which is here. Uh. It would be your link color. Oh, that's probably defined up near the top with root. Yeah. Uh, is yes. it color accents? Is that your links? Yes, uh, that's the links, and then color light and color dark are looks like the ones that are defined behind them. All right, so here's that. And then we want to go, let's start with the color that works against your light yeah. color. All right. Um, so for small text, we can try... Actually, wonder. Yeah, is small yeah. text. That we're I think to I think small text. Yeah, for that would probably fit the, the criteria because I can see if the large bold text one was small. I don't think I'd, I'd yeah. be able to see that very well. So I so think let's try replacing that. See what happens. We we totally can. I'm worried that this actually makes the color darker, which means it's going to be even harder to um, okay match against our our dark color. Um. Earth, That's right. Hello. You made it. Howdy, Earth. Um Yeah, all right. So we have um uh, we're we're trying out a new color here. Uh let's see. Um so this this has changed up a whole lot here. Um yeah. and now we can see that this black is even uh a little harder to yeah. see against um <clears throat> against the background. But I bet you this link is no longer gonna fail. Yeah, so let's see what happens. Do some mad science. Um, we've got Mark is recommending the color contrast analyzer from Teller Group. Yes, I, I haven't Ooh. used that one before. I think that's a full blown application. Um, TP, I think they're TPGI now is what they're called. Um, and it's the like British spelling, or not in this case. Okay. okay. Um. Yeah, this this is uh like a whole application you can install that'll give you like a, a oh, wow. dropper that you can like pick a color. So there are tons of great tools. Actually, there is one that I enjoy using and maybe it'll actually help us out here. But it's called oh I have to be so careful when I Google this. Uh because yeah. Uh we're going to there we go. Um the contrast triangle, Ooh. which um Let's you actually do three ways. So this might actually help us out quite a bit. Um, wow. When we're figuring this out. Um, yeah. So let's go back to our page here. Um, it is going to gripe right. at us about color contrast. We we knew that this text was no longer going to work, but um, looks like the header uh, here is no longer working. Yeah. All of yeah. our dark colors are there. Yeah. Um, so it might be, let's see, to get the color working for, uh, like, against the light background, we had to pick a darker color. However, right. if we wanted to get a color working against a dark background, we need a lighter color. I'm wondering if it might be helpful for us to have two variants of this accent color. Like, one that No, would I think so, too. Okay. I think, yeah, I okay. think that, yeah, we need maybe to change up the CSS a little bit and All right. have, like, an accent dark Maybe. Yeah, maybe um, maybe what we call this is an accent on light, and then we can have okay. an accent on dark. Um, yes. And and so now let's I guess pick the accent on dark. Um, so we're gonna swing back here, uh, back to this. This is a nifty tool. I I do like this. Okay. Uh, FF7A3F is the okay. color that it's recommending for this one. Um, so let's give it a try. Let's let's see how well that works. Yeah. Now, for everything, we need to pick whether uh, it's going to be an accent on light or an accent on dark. Right. Yeah. Let's find color let's find accent. Links. Oh. Oh, no. Focus. Oh, that's going to be a different, because that's oh, going to be on no. both. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm starting to see problems with this approach perhaps yeah um section subtitle intro and about is that that might actually also be oh uh Tam says it's exponential um okay yeah. should we should we go back to the color triangle yeah uh, let's, let's triangle try that contrast to let's, see that so yeah this this should hopefully pick help us pick a, a three-way color here so um our 
link text. Link is what we would want. Uh, so th this is the accent color here. Um, is is what we would want here. So I'm going to pick, this is going to be one of our background colors. And then this is going to be our white background color. So we'll see what we're they can that. find. Where is our fake white? Um, let's see. And then, oh, I didn't realize there. Oh yeah, yeah. It updates all this stuff in real time. So then we pick the the color that we started off with. This FF seven three three eight, which is a lovely color, by the way. Love it. Orange is good. Yeah, so it's going to tell us, uh, yeah, we actually need to meet a 4.5 here, and we yeah, want to meet a 4.5 here. So let's find ways to do this. I'm wondering if we make it, oh, this, this might be, this might be hard. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're just going to. Move this around a bit and see if we can get this to pick anything. Ooh. I don't know that we're going to be able to min max this. This is okay. So, this is. Yeah. This, this is a hard thing. We might challenge. need to move the value of the color, too. The. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, mm. Oh. Aha. Uh Here we go. HSL mode. This is going to be, I think, a little more intuitive for. Um, people yeah chan's saying love this contrast triangle tool super cool little utility yes i use this all the time because um as it says here in the body text um you, your 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 links should be uh they should stand out from the their surrounding text but they also still need to stand out around their background uh so that introduces this like three-way contrast problem that's uh a challenge sometimes okay so let's find out if I can, you know, maybe pick, what if I pick, like, 30? What happens? Getting closer runs yeah. in the background link. Uh, 25. This, this may not be the most feasible solution to this. Yeah. Um, I wonder if I could just, um, and, and we may have to make a decision here about where, if we want to keep working with yeah. this um, or continue on and, and see what Axe has to say, right? Um, but I wonder if I could just, if there's any resources that have like built in accessible color schemes for you and then I could just rework the entire site with those, you know? Yeah, um, I do know friend of the show, Stephanie Eccles has a project called Alley Color Tokens, which I believe is meant to address this problem. Um, so let me stick this in the uh, Twitch chat and then also stick it in the uh, the Zoom yeah. chat for you. There we go. So this Thank is you. this is one way that you might be able to uh, pick some some colors, uh, which is strange because I I really do like the color scheme that you've got here. I think these these colors are lovely. Um, I think we might just need to rework or or think uh, you you might want to rework. Um, Kind of where you're using your accents, or maybe have like different variants of accents. Actually, uh, if I go to yeah. my own site, um, I have I have like three core colors, but for I each of it. those colors, I've got like four or five variants, um, depending on kind of the color contrast needs. So um, there's different ways you could solve this, but I with with the time that we've got, maybe it's best to dive into acts and treat this as kind of an unsolved for now problem. Right, um, yeah. Travis is saying that we could grab an analogous color. Yeah, that's that's probably true. Um, uh, just kind of pick a, a color that's like close enough in both cases. Um, cool. Yeah, so let me, let me actually probably go back and um, into the code, which is here. I think I'm going to undo all of our CSS changes for now, but that yeah, is, like those are some tools that we would, probably want to dive into if we were going to pick or yeah. some new approaches we would dive into if we wanted to pick some new colors cool um so the next tool that we wanted to go over was axe um can you tell me a bit more about axe and, and what it is 
Yeah, um, so it's very similar to Lighthouse, except I don't believe it analyzes your site for things like performance, right? It's it's all accessibility. Um, you'll find it again in your dev tools. And um, I think you just informed me that uh, Lighthouse works with apps for their accessibility reports. Um, yeah, I think Lighthouse, so Axe is actually like, there's a whole suite of products by um, DQ Systems, which DQ. is an accessibility mm -hmm. resource. Um, and so there's this like, first of all, there's this uh, like NPM package called Axe 4, which is like the, uh, this is the engine that powers a lot of Axe tools. Um, and I believe, I could be wrong here, but I believe um, Google's Lighthouse is powered in part by Axe 4, at least for the accessible agents. So, um, but we are going to be using um, an interface around Axe 4, which is Axe Dev Tools. Um, yeah. So there's a link to that. Um, it is kind of meant for enterprise stuff, but I believe right. you could install a free version somewhere. Uh, yeah, I think they recently they switched it from from a free version to a free trial. Um, Mark says uh, that when we ran our lighthouse scans, it actually told us the X version it was using at the bottom. Um, <laughs> which is awesome. awesome. Cool. Uh, yeah. So let's. Uh, so that's where you would go to install Axe. I've already installed Axe. So let's go ahead and uh, run us an Axe scan. Um, so how would I go about doing this? Uh, so you see your Lighthouse tab at the top? Yep. Hit the arrow next to it. You got it. And then you should have Axe Dev Tools in the bottom. Yeah. All right. Um, and then do you like to scan all of your page? Or well, I guess we probably I guess like to, I like to scan all of my page. Uh, <laughs> For reasons like like ones I just saw, um, but yeah, this is more issues than we saw with the uh, with Lighthouse, right? It's fourteen rather than yeah. I think Lighthouse identified a couple. So, um, so we're seeing the color contrast, and oh, maybe just count them differently. Um, oh, could be because six of them are the color contrast issue. So it does a little bit of a whereas with Lighthouse we saw. Um, with its percentage, it was counting every issue by topic rather than by instances, right? This mm -hmm. is counting them by instance. So I, I like that. Um, then we've got some that it, I don't think Lighthouse did identify, like the ID attribute value must be unique. And I think we can yep. click on that to see more. Links with um, the same name have a similar purpose. Documents yeah. should have one name. Um, all page content should be contained by landmarks. Yeah, so let's dive into, is there one you wanted to look into first? Well, let's just do the ID attribute value one and see what see what they have to say. All right. So uh, I think I can, actually, I'm not finding a way to, like, expand this uh, dialogue down here, okay. but it's All giving right. us more information about this down below. Wish I could resize things better, but, okay, so it's saying, hey, it's a minor issue. Actually, first of all, when you run a report, when you're looking at one of these issues, what do you look at first? Uh, I have like a, a top-down approach, <laughs> so okay. um, I just look at the first issue first. And since we have already dove, dove dived into the sufficient color contrast issue, I was thinking, let's just take the ID attribute value. It also, you know, depends on how much uh, time I've had parceled out. Uh, so. Since I'm seeing we have one instance here, um, I'm thinking it would be a good thing to dive into and maybe it, uh, completely address it okay. by the end of our, our stream. So it's telling us, hey, uh, this is a minor impact. Um, mm -hmm. It was found automatically. Uh, it tells us, ensure every ID attribute value is unique. And then it gives us this location here, which is... Um, I'm dotting everything. Oh, so I must have two homes in there. Yeah. To solve this issue, you need to uh, fix the following. You've got multiple elements. Yeah. Okay. So there's, it looks like it's saying your your intro section has the home ID, but then also it looks like your intro dash T element has that same ID. We can, we can inspect both. So I can click inspect 
And actually, okay. yeah, we, we see it right here. We've got second yeah. class intro ID equals home, and then div class equals intro key ID equals home. Um, so how would you like to fix this, Lucia? Um, let's, A, I think I could find a more descriptive ID. Um, and okay. then, but B will probably need to go in it because the ramification will be that the class no longer applies to them, right? The, the ID class. So I have to make sure in our CSS that anything that is identified by the class or not the class, the ID home is, is changed so that the style is still apply. So we've got our section class equals intro ID equals home. And then here mm -hmm. class intro key ID equals home. Um, do you want to change one or both of these IDs? Um, let's change both of them because I, home doesn't describe either of them. Sure. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm going to try to be super descriptive of this because I don't want to just say ID is intro in case um, it's been a while since I looked at my all through my entire style.css file. So I might have another intro style that would then apply. So let's do um, maybe intro dash section here. Intro section, you got it. Okay. And then down here, uh, probably intro dash p will probably work for that one. Okay. Okay. Now you said we should dive into the styles here. So let's look for any use of home. It actually doesn't look like you're using the home ID. Okay. So. All right. So we should be fine, I think. I think yeah. that's all we have to do here. Let's give it a shot. Uh, give us a hard refresh just in case. Go to Axe, Channel. There's one viewer issue. And if I look here, nice. I don't see any of them that say duplicated IDs. Nice. Yeah. So let's um, maybe, so there, maybe there's a better way I could address picking the first issue to look at. Are there any, can we tell that if there are any that are uh, identified as serious? Okay, serious is six. I think that's the color contrast. Yeah. So, yeah. So how about the moderate ones? I guess that's all we have left. Okay. Um, it tells us documents should have one main landmark and that all page content should be contained by landmarks. Um, okay. I think that this is actually probably we can fix both of these at the same time. Yeah, two birds. Um, so if I dive into this, uh, actually, let me dive into all page content. Um, have a good one, Chan. Uh, good, good seeing you. Um, yeah, so it tells us all page content should be contained by landmarks and then um, one of the things I love to do when I'm using tools like this is I love to click the highlight button. So that way it'll like mm. show us what element um, it's telling us about. So first of all, it's saying this element right here, it's not inside a landmark. Um, okay. And then if I go to the next one, this element right here, also not inside of a landmark. Okay. So it's so taking shape in my head, the issue a little better now. Can yeah. See these highlights? Um, so you can use the highlight tool to indicate specifically which element it is. Um, and then if you need to look at the DOM node, you can always click inspect and it'll take you into the elements, uh, okay. tab. So you can look at this. Um, yeah. And so here we can see our overall, uh, markup. And if I go back into our acts report, we can see that we've got this, uh, this other issue, which is documents should have one main landmark. So it's like, well, mm -hmm. we've got a landmark problem and then we've got a bunch of things that aren't in a landmark. Right. Um, and so this is going to tell us like, Hey, um, Ensure the document has a main landmark. Um, basically, it's complaining the whole document doesn't have this. Um, and it doesn't actually give us all that much more information, but we could click on more info here. And this will give us much more information about yeah. what it is we're trying to address. Uh, it tells us that it's not really a success criterion, but it is a best yeah. practice. Okay. Um, so it's probably, I wonder if that had anything to do with their. Uh, Classification is moderate uh, issue. Yeah. Um, so, how do you want to address this? Role. So, is I wonder. I just wonder how. How I, I would have to look into the HTML again. Header, nav, main, and footer. So, do we need a main tag, or is it that I'm not defining the roles? Is my question. Uh, 
it so you, these days you don't usually need to put like main rolly book main this tends to be superfluous um and, and people recommend against it but um yeah we could put a main tag around you know the main contents of the page um and that would be more or less most of the page right um yeah uh maybe not the header maybe but i mean if i go back to your page here um yeah, I mean, this is maybe uh, the the nav perhaps maybe could be outside, but like the rest yeah. of this is just straight up. This is what people would consider the page. It's not like sidebars yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. The footer can probably say outside as well. Um, yeah, so let's figure out. Let's go back into the code and figure out the best place to put this this main around. Um, I go here. The thing it did not complain about, right? Like it started with yeah. like the the section, right? The it's section. Not, yeah. It it uh was not worried about the uh header at all. So we will I think go ahead and start here. And then yeah. put just about everything in there except yeah. for if you've got a footer, we won't put the footer in there. Um, and I think that will we do it. Let's find out, move it in a little bit. Cool. See what happens. Yeah. So, first of all, if I go into our uh, markup here, we can see that we now have a main, right? And it's got all mm -hmm. of our sections in there, which is exciting. Um, and now, if I go into the Axe Dev Tools, scan. Uh, look at that. Uh, yeah. It tells us we have eight issues. Six of them are serious, and the other two just... Oh, they're needs review. That's what they are. Interesting. We'll talk about yeah. the needs review as well. Yeah. But, yeah, notice that the... Um, both of the landmark-related issues are, are gone, because everything is yeah. now in a landmark element. Um, yeah, uh... One issue I have faced, this is from Kamal, uh, one issue I have faced is that all tools identify different, um, in parentheses, non-overlapping issues. Um, how do we resolve this problem? Yeah, so um, different tools are surfacing different defects. Um, so what do you do in that scenario? Yeah, um, I think, uh, first of all, if there are different tools surfacing different defects, I... Uh, use both of them, but also uh, if they're not overlapping, I don't consider it too much of an issue as like, oh, both tools are showing me different ways to improve my website, right? So that's that's not terrible. Maybe like if one of them is missing something really obvious, you could write or tweet at the at the tool and say, hey, I was noticing that it missed this on my web page or just talk to a developer at their company, right? Um, but if they're overlapping, say, um i i i'm trying to come up with like what actually happened but one time i ran axe and one time i ran lighthouse and this is interesting because we know that they're that the same company is kind of behind the functionality right but um when i tried to fish fix an issue in lighthouse axe would bring up a tool and then i would or bring up a, an issue and then when i tried to fix that issue it would pop back up in in uh, Lighthouse, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in, in that case, um, it's time to maybe do some user tests, like manual testing, and see see if that can okay. inform your choice, or you know, seek out an expert's uh, advice on the matter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it is worth noting that uh, different um, tools will be looking for different sets of requirements. Um, usually there'll, there'll be a setting for like, what degree of web content accessibility conformance are you trying to meet and stuff like that? Like, are you trying to meet level A, double A, triple A? Um, mm -hmm. And then there's some like acts here are including best practices. Um, you'll also note that like different automated tools will, will have different selling points. So um, acts, for instance, is very proud of this idea of like no false positives. Um, especially when you're running like Axe Core um, against your your project like in the uh, command line, um, 
it will, if it finds something that it thinks it might be an issue, like, it'll try to be very explicit about it, um, as opposed to, in all cases, saying this is a problem. Because sometimes it's like, well, mm, not necessarily. Um, like, actually, again, if I go to uh, my site, um, so technically this header here is, mm -hmm. like, the, the styles are applied by a, a gradient. Um, and you can imagine mm -hmm. that if you have text on top of gradients, that might be very difficult for computers to efficiently uh, calculate um, the color contrast score. Um, and so the these tools usually kind of bail out and go, well, you've got some text on a gradient. It might be an issue. It might not. In this case, it's pretty clearly not an issue. Um, but it'll be like, you should know. We can't guarantee this is good. We can't guarantee this is a problem. But one way or another, you should you should at least know about this. So that that's kind of some of the differences between some of the tools that we use. Yeah. Um, all right. Cool. So the needs review, I think if we turn the best practices off, or no, that, that'll still be there. But um, yeah, let's see what it says. Let me see if I can pop this. Out. That might make things easier to look at. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. So it's telling us this issue needs your review. When an issue is flagged for review, it means we're not 100% sure it's actually a problem. Use the information we've provided to decide if it's a problem or not. Um, Interesting. So it's going to tell us that we have some links with similar names here. Uh, so the. Uh, oh, okay. So there's, I don't think there's even an alt text on that one. Um, there, no. so Maybe. we have a link. This is for a Mars app that you built. It has an okay. image inside, and that image has a website mockup alt text. And so that means that the link is being announced as website mockup. But gotcha. if you have two mockups, which I'm pretty sure you might, then yeah. that means that they're both doing the same thing. Let's see, inspect website mockup. And then if I go into the other one, right, um, website mockup. There we go. Okay. Um, so I think a way we could fix that is probably, um, first of all, I mean, I'd, I'd love your input on creating alt text because I actually find it, even though people say it's a simple thing, like, you know, just slap an alt in every image, I find it very difficult to describe it, my images properly. Um, yeah. And then second, I think I should probably just slap like a Mars in front of the Mars website mockup and then a NASA in front of the NASA website mockup and that'll differentiate at least between them. But but in the first place, I'm still not sure that that is because it says it's a mock-up, but that doesn't describe what's in the image, right? So yeah, um, I think this is one of those things that's like very contextual, and so I'm going to share a resource I love, which is WebAIM's resource here. Um, so when you're describing an image, because you want to describe its contents, um, kind of the heuristic I follow is how would you describe this if you were describing it to your friend over the phone? Right? Like, oh, I've got an image in front of me. Um, mm. Like, I've got an image in front of me, Lucia, and I'm telling you about this image, but I can't just, like, hold it up to the camera. How would I describe it to you? Right. Um, that tends to be the heuristic I would use, because um, that helps me focus on, like, what's actually important. What am I trying to convey with this image? Um, and it this uh, this post makes, uh, makes that point when it says context is everything. Um, the same image in different websites might mean different things. It gives this example of like the presidential portrait of George Washington and it says, hey, if you're uh like if if you're in a bio of George Washington, it might be sufficient to say presidential portrait of George Washington. However, if this is an art blog, then the fact that it's George Washington matters a lot less than talking about things like brush strokes right. and stuff like that. So you might go into detail about these painting style and stuff like that. Um and oh, I'm gonna have to check out this link from Mark. Um, and so, uh, this kind of this context is incredibly important. And the reason I bring this up is because the image that you've got here is what we would call a functional image. So you know how when you have like a logo in your nav bar, like 
and that logo is wrapped in a link, you just know that that logo is going to take you to the homepage. Yeah. Right? Um, so you wouldn't necessarily describe the contents of the logo. You might instead make the alt the site name because it's functional. It serves the purpose, which is taking you mm. to the homepage of the site. So when you navigate to that link, you don't want image of a gray silhouette of a head with some gears in it and the text webbing. The alt text should yeah. probably just say webbing because then you want it to announce link webbing. Um, yeah. So, so that, that seems like a similar scenario to what I have going on my website right now. Yeah, I think so. Um, so with that in mind, let's write some functional alt text here. So if you're... Uh, so this is for Mars photo album, right? So that that yeah. might even be straight up the alt text. Yeah, exactly. Same thing for the space apps project here. All right. You got it. Um, that is the wrong direction. I'm, I'm so bad at like remembering which way I need to swipe. Um, yeah. Yeah. So now if I dive into our markup here, we'll see that we've got alt equals Mars photo album um, and alt equals NASA space apps 2020. Oh, uh, Travis is saying a problem I used to do was say photo of yada, yada, yada. Yeah, for sure. Because like yeah. when, when you're a screen reader user and you navigate to an image, whichever screen reader you use is going to preface that with image and then the alt text. So so then you have image photo of and that's just... Yeah, it's just redundant just, uh, and it's clutter. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, let's let's try running... Let's try running Axe again. Dev tools, scan it all. Um, links with the same name have a similar purpose. Let's see if um, it's identifying the same ones. So this time it seems to say GitHub is your problem, um, uh -huh. and this is in your project. So you've got two. Ooh, yeah, yeah. Um, two. That's the link to the to the GitHub in that uh, the repo of my projects. Yeah, um, yeah, it's but then it's going to say that the other one is, where, where is the other one? Uh, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we just actually changed this to say GitHub. Um, yeah. I think we can change the, the one in the paragraph. Um, yeah. It's probably just view my GitHub repo maybe instead of. Yeah, let's do that. Um, I like that. Let me close out of this. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, Mark was saying that the home ID uh, was being used in the navigation, not in the, the CSS. That makes that makes sense. I will not open Discord at this moment. I will open up. <laughs> um, yeah, so here, view it on. We could say view my GitHub request. So now CSS. your social link still says GitHub. But this link right here says GitHub repo. Um, you might have looked at that, I think, and said, you know what, it's fine. I I, I don't necessarily feel like I need to change this. I, I feel like that's one of those like more subjective decisions to make. Right. Um, once again, can't play. There we go. Okay, so this now says GitHub repo. If I run access tools. Um, so far, the only thing that's left is that pillar contrast we hear, uh, we've already <laughs> acknowledged and we'll, we'll fix on our own time. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, we're getting close to time, so I'd like to, to spend a bit of time talking about, um, uh, maybe some of the caveats of using, um, automated accessibility tests like this. Um, uh, yeah, so... This is great, right? We were able to use this to solve problems we were actively facing on our site. We took kind of this iterative approach of just tackling a, a problem at a time, trying to understand what that problem was. Um, so I don't need manual testing anymore, right? Um, well, even the tools tell us to use it. So <laughs> I think we're actually, we're looking at an instance right now where we see that this link, there's an issue with it, with the color contrast, right, which we've been looking at. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we have a target equals blank as well, which is not the reason why Axe brought this up. So I will, I think I, I have a, a post on, 
fun to um, yeah, it's called three ways to make target equals blank accessible. Um, because basically you never want to surprise somebody with a link that just pops them up into a new tab. Um, and I have it in your Zoom chat there too, and I can pop it into the, yeah. Um, and I actually have, after I wrote this, someone commented and pointed out a uh, security issue with target equals blank. So I've moved away from using that in general. Um, but basically those three ways all make it easier to see when a target equals blank, which just, you know, that, that opens up the link in a new tab, right? Um, when that's coming at you, <laughs> because uh, the, the user might not expect it um, and it could cause cause problems because all of a sudden you're on a new page and what you were navigating through is no longer there. Um, so if we scroll down, let's see how I fixed this. Um, so there, there's a little bit of a more complex solution where you can add CSS classes and make a warning message um, for screen reader only. Um, another way is just to make it obvious just in your copy and just say this, by the way, you know, right before it, like oh. you can view this link that will, or uh, in some way warn the reader, like instead of I'm a bah, new tab, but Darling Magazine opens a new, new window. Yeah, yeah, something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, except I think I would want that before the link just so that the reader would read it out before. So otherwise you might click on it before you even. So the reason that I uh, put it inside the link is that uh -huh. um, if I'm a screen reader user and I'm tabbing through the page and I land on this link through tabbing, mm -hmm. like I want something like this to be like part of the name so that it gives included in the announcement. Oh, yeah, that um, makes that makes a lot more sense. Also, screen reader users have modes where they can skip from element to element of a certain type, um, including links, and that means that links like this can appear out of context. Right, so you can't necessarily guarantee that someone has hit static text around this link. That's why I was yeah. kind of sticking in the anchor tag. I mean, that'll inform my whole link naming process in the uh, future as well. You know, because now if they're just tapping through links, mm -hmm. this link says at Darling Magazine opens a new window. So yeah, and, what and, is that link to? <laughs> um, thank you, Mark. Mark's Mark's on top of this. Holy cow. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and you mentioned in your article that, like, there are, like, Oops. screen reader utility classes that you can use that you could do something like uh, class equals, you called it screen reader only, but uh, it'll visually hide the element uh, without uh, removing it from screen reader access. So, like, that way you only know, really, that it's going external. Like, you only get that, like, announcement if you're actively using a, a screen reader. So there are definitely options that you could do here. Um, yeah, I, on this problem of what can automated tools help us with, um, for me, like, I, I think devs get very automation happy. It's like, oh, we can solve all the things with automation. And yet accessibility, there are quite a few things like color contrast that are pretty well solved with a, with automation, right? Like you can have a computer run this formula on a whole bunch of elements really quickly, much faster than any accessibility tester could, right? Um, right. And that's something that's well solved by accessibility. Uh, sorry, with automation. But something like alt text is something that uh, it's easy for a computer to decide whether an image has alt text, but it's right. really difficult for the computer to decide whether that alt text is meaningful or helpful. Yeah, I think we see a, an analogous issue in automated testing as well. Oh, yeah? Um, not just automated accessibility testing, but like testing. Uh, sometimes, you know, we have these engines that, what was it that I used to, uh, say you use like a smoke test in React. Like that's not the only thing you want your React component to do is show up, right? Um, so some people run all their smoke tests and be like, okay, cool, we're done with testing. But you want to be able to test what they do, just like the, computer can test that an alt script is there, but it can't test what it mm -hmm. what it tells the person using the screen reader. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm also interested to follow. I know like DQ Systems has been doing a lot more work with like automated tools that'll 
surface potential flows in your applications and like identify like hey this is something you might be curious about like um there's they're building a tool called intelligent guided testing which i'd love to have glinda sims on she's done some fantastic presentations about this awesome. subject but like designed to make it easier to find potential issues without saying yay or nay on whether it is an issue just because a lot of accessibility is really about the user experience right and and that's going to be mm -hmm. kind of inherently subjective uh you're not always going to 100 percent of the time be able to um say like a correct answer um especially with a a uh, computer that has right. no idea about the context of your site right it's 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 like it is i think with a lot of the ways we use machines is it's important to stay curious in order to use them well <laughs> i love that i love that that's um, I love tools like Lighthouse and Axe where they like they surface these issues, but then every time they, they always point you to a link um, on web.dev or on DQ where they tell you like, hey, here's why this is an issue. Here's um, ways you might address this um, because I've definitely seen like, oh, um, our accessibility auditors have come back with a default um, and... Oh, sorry, they've, they've come back with a defect and we were like, we need to fix this now, but we don't necessarily know what it is we're trying to solve or why. It's just like we've been right. told like, oh, hey, this column needs this scope attribute. It's like, well, okay. Uh, it's easy to mess up or, or create an incomplete experience that way. But these tools give you the resources needed to be curious and to find out what problems you're solving. And that I love them for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, all right. I, uh, is there anything more you'd like to say about automated accessibility testing before we, uh, wrap up? Um, that's it. I'd like to, if you haven't tried them yet, I'd like to encourage you to use them. They're a great starting point and they're a lot of fun. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Lucia. Um, it has been great having you. Uh, this has been a, a great time. Um, and I, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, Y'all join us next week. We're going to be um, actually doing some open source. I've had an open source accessibility education project in mind, um, and it's something I'd like to get y'all's involvement um, on. So you should absolutely come join us next week, Tuesday. Oh, that's well, exciting. Yeah. yeah. Um, go go follow Lucia. Um, and uh, also, while you're at it, go follow Semantics on Twitter. This is how you find out about all the streams. We upload videos of the streams uh, complete with captions, and um, if you want to keep up with all, all the streams that are uploaded, um, the, the uh, Twitter is the best place to do that. So, y'all, thank you so much for, for joining. Um, Dave and Travis, thank you so much for joining. It's been great having y'all. Uh, uh, thanks so much for following. Um, Mark, thank you for being in the chat with all those helpful resources. Y'all, yes. been good. <laughs> Have a great Global Accessibility Awareness Day, and I'll see you soon. Bye, y'all. Bye.